The German reformer, Martin Luther, could not find spiritual satisfaction. So he read the Apostle Paul's writings called the Book of Romans to help give him peace of mind. Now Luther's study revealed to him the grace of God. And in the year 1508, he comes to a conclusion that the Catholic Church and its system of work righteousness was contrary to the teachings that he discovered in the New Testament. The statement of Paul that the just shall live by faith began to make a very deep impression upon Luther's new understanding. When the Catholic Church sent an individual by the name of John Tisdale to sell indulgence was that meaning to grant forgiveness of sins near Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther at that time was teaching in the university. In 1517, Luther nailed on a church door in Wittenberg 95 Thesis, stating his opposition to this evil practice of selling indulgence. When Luther rebelled against the salvation of works ethics that was being advocated by the Catholic Church, he took the position of sola scriptural, which is Latin for sola meaning alone, and scriptura meaning writing or scripture only. It is that the scripture alone is authoritative for the faith as well as the practice for a New Testament Christian. Now the Catholic Church demanded that Luther repent his heresy and Luther's response was unless he was convinced by scripture and sound reason, reasoning that he was to be proven false then he would but if not he could not renounce his position and he was not willing to bow a knee to the Pope or a Catholic council or any human tradition. Martin Luther with moral courage embraced a position that had long been forgotten by most of humanity and if practiced Scripture only is the downfall of Catholicism as well as the Protestant churches. Which brings up this vital question. How shall we approach the Bible as one's only authority in religion? A, con a contemporary of Luther, a Swiss reformer named Ulrich Swingley, said that the Scriptures are the only rule of faith and practice for Christians and that the New Testament presents a formative pattern. Now a fellow that nobody basically ever heard of but his name is Dirk Phillips. He wrote in the latter part of the 15th century. He says, it is evident that whatever God has not commanded and has not instituted by express commands of Scripture, he does not want observed, nor does he want to be served therewith, nor will he have his words set aside, nor made to suit the pleasures of men. End of quote. One of the several early 19th century American Restoration leaders, Alexander Campbell, wrote this. We choose to speak of Bible things by Bible words because we are always suspicious that if the word is not in the Bible, the idea which it represents is not there, and always confident that the things taught by God are better taught in the words and under the names which the Holy Spirit has chosen and appropriated than in the words which our man's wisdom teaches." End of quote. So what are these intelligent religious writers all saying through these centuries? This is what they're saying. Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances or the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Now these oracles of God are the Old Testament writings as well as the New Testament writings. Peter spoke 
And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks through him to God the Father. Colossians 3, 17. So since to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus means to do it by his authority, clearly God desires us to have Bible authority for all that we teach and practice. Now this is a revolutionary concept in today's world. That is the simple practice of using the scripture only to guide us in our daily lives. The U.S. Supreme Court in D.C. is the highest judicial body in our land. It consists of a chief justice and eight associate justice. The Supreme Court has authority over all the nation, even the president. God's Supreme Court today is the New Testament. What the Chief Justice, the Holy Spirit, directed the eight judges or the nine inspired, inspired writers to write down in the New Testament, these are the laws and patterns for the entire human family. Its 260 chapters comprise the totality of God's New Testament revealed will in and for the Christian age. It is absolute and final and will stand till the day of judgment. Jesus said, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings as one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. John 12, verse 48. So does the New Testament have authority over mankind today, or is it just only for those who believe in it? The average person looks at religion, like college, a sports team, club, or military service. If enrolls in a school of higher learning, there's fees, papers, tests, classes to attend. If one joins a team or club, they go to practices, they uh, go to meetings, they obey the coach or the leader, they abide by the rules, and then they show up for the games and the events. If one enlists in the armed forces, they have to go through boot camp, they have a couple years of yes sir, no sir, and then also making their beds. But if a person chooses not to sign up, enroll, join, then he or she has no obligations, no responsibilities, or consequences. And many feel that way religiously. If they are not part of a church, they don't have to answer to the obligations, the responsibilities, and the consequences of the Bible. They have a free ride through life. So, is church membership like these other groups. No, religion is different. One cannot just opt out of New Testament Christianity without future penalties. Now here is what I mean by this expression of later penalties. God exists whether or not man believes in him. Denying scripture does not change the Bible's validity or release, run, uh, release one from living by God's standards. Jesus will not ignore us just because we ignore him. Rejecting the Spirit's word, the Bible does not alter the reality of a coming day of judgment. In Acts 24, verse 25, the Apostle Paul was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Felix, the Roman procurator of Judea, was cruelly immoral, therefore not righteous in practicing self-control. So the thought of judgment, it scared him. 
and he ignores Paul's discussion by burying his head in the sand and says, we'll get together later on this subject matter. High up government official or lowly garbage collector, there is a coming final day of accountability. Now having said this, upon what basis can God command all mankind to serve him? God can because he owns man's patent. God has authority over the world because he made it. God has the right to govern man because he created man in his own image, Genesis 1, 27. God designed the procreative process that produces everyone now living so he owns our copyright. His love desires the best for us. So he urges us to serve him for our benefit, not his. God can mandate mankind to serve him because man owes his landlord. If you live in America, then you cannot opt out on obeying America's laws or obey, uh, paying America taxes. Since the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, Psalms 24, 1, we are living on God's land, breathing God's air, drinking God's water, and eating from God's bounty. Every good thing in our lives comes from the source above. Truly, in Him we live and move and exist. Acts 17, 28. As His tenants, we are subject to His divine laws. God can decree mankind to serve Him because Jesus was given authority over all earth's inhabitants. When Christ ascended after conquering sin, death, Satan and hell, God crowned him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. It was customary for ancient kings to give favored individuals whatever they asked. You find that in 1 Samuel 27, 6 and Esther 5, verse 6. So God promised his son the nations as thine inheritance and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Psalms 2, verse 8. After his resurrection, Jesus affirmed that he had been given all authority in heaven and in the earth. So uh, Matthew 28, verse 18. The universality of this supremacy means that all are subject to him whether they submit or not. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Hebrews 2, verse 8. God can determine mankind to serve him because man owes a debt that he can never pay. Jesus describes man's sin as moral debts in Matthew 6, verse 12. And Jesus pictured a lifetime of sins as 10,000 talent debt in Matthew 18, verse 23 to 35, which is as huge amount of money that is unpayable debt. To deny the reality of sin does not cancel one's debt any more than denying a college loan or a home mortgage causes a bank to drop it from its record. Now the good news is that Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary can cover each person's debt. Jesus offered forgiveness of debt, of sins, to believers who repent and are baptized, Acts 2, verse 38. God can dictate mankind to serve him because man has an unavoidable appointment with judgment day. Jesus gave us this preview, but when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 33. The entire world will be judged, Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. 
Yet the prevailing philosophy of today is, I'll live my life as I please. We can only avoid answering to God for so long. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. It is inescapable, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. Romans 14, verse 10 and 11. Daniel Webster, a statesman, not a politician, served our nation the first half of the 19th century, was asked what he considered to be the most important thought that ever occupied his mind. His response, my gravest thought has been that I shall someday stand before God in judgment and give an account of how I have lived. Let each one of us know for certain that our case is now on the docket of God's final court. Therefore, let us study his revealed New Testament, prepare self well for this future reckoning as he desires to judge in our favor. Which brings us to, did the Bible writers claim to write divine revelation? Do the scriptures claim to be a message revealed from God himself to man? Do they claim to be an infallible standard of religious authority for people to obey today? Do they claim people of future generations should study them to learn of God's commandments? Now it is true that we are not under any obligation to follow the laws of the Old Testament unless they are restated in the New Covenant as, com uh, as commands to follow. For example, the fourth command of the Old Testament, Ten Commandments, is to remember and keep the Sabbath holy. This is Exodus 20, verse 8. It is not found in the New Covenant as a command for the New Testament church to obey, but the other nine are in the New Testament as commands or principles to still practice. Yet it does help us to better be able to comprehend the significance of the claims of the New Testament if we first understand the claims that the Old Testament writers made concerning their writings. The Old Testament writers claim to write commands given directly to them from God for the people. In Exodus 24, verse 4, And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Moses said, God will bless the people if you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. Deuteronomy 30, verse 9 and 10. So the expression, thus saith the Lord, or the words of the Lord came to me, are found many times in the Old Testament. Folks are seriously mistaken when they say that the Old Testament Bible writers did not know what they, that they were writing revelations of God's will intended to serve as law or authority to people that would follow. They did know, and they said so. These writings were intended to serve as law or authority for both the present as well as future generations. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 24 to 29, you find this. The words Moses wrote were laws intended to prevent the people from departing from God. This would include future generations among the sons of Israel. Back in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18 and 20, the future kings of Israel were to have a copy of the law that they might Keep obeying them, not departing either to the right or the left. Folks are seriously mistaken when they claim that the writings were intended only for the current generation to whom they were addressed and not future generations. In fact, the messages were written down for the expressed intent 
that they would be preserved for people in the generations to come. In Exodus 17, verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial. Isaiah 30, verse 8, Go now, write it on a tablet before them, and inscribe it on a scroll, that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. By God's, by God's guidance, later generations did use the Old Testament writings as a pattern of authority. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, after Moses died, Joshua was told to use the book of the law written by Moses as his guide, that he might observe all the commands written therein. Now, when Joshua is ready to die, he charged the nation of Israel to follow the commands written by Moses. And that was, he says in his own book, chapter 23, verse 6. Be very firm, then, to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, so that you may not turn aside from it the right hand or to the left. It is a serious mistake to think that God's work is not intended as a pattern of guidance, or that later generations shouldn't study and obey it as a life-given guide for right and wrong. The scriptures declare that it is exactly how they should be used. To reject these claims is to say that they are not good books at all, but false and misleading. So why accept them as being from God at all? If these writers are incorrect about this, how do we know that what they say is right and wrong on any other thing to obey? Let us now notice the claims of the New Testament concerning the Old Testament. By the time of Jesus, the Old Testament had been completed for hundreds of years. They had been collected, conserved, copied, and circulated. The first century Jews quoted Old Testament scripture as a standard of authority. Now, what attitude did Jesus and his apostles show towards the use of the Old Testament? Now remember, Jesus and his disciples never hesitated to disagree with the Jews if they were spiritually wrong on any Old Testament point. Did they object to how the Jews viewed the Old Testament? Did they say God never intended for the scriptures to be written and circulated as authority and law? Did they say that the scriptures were not intended for future generations? By understanding how Jesus and the faithful first century Christians viewed and treated the Old Testament scripture, we can understand how we today should view and treat the complete scriptures as we have them. What was Jesus' attitude towards the Old Testament scriptures? Jesus quoted scripture as the authoritative revelation from God. In Matthew 15, verse 1 to 6, Jesus quotes Old Testament scripture as being the commandment of God, verse 3. For God said, verse 4, the word of God, verse 6. In Matthew 26, the Sadducees, they confront Jesus about the resurrection. And he says that they were mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, verse 29. Then he cites a scripture written by Moses to answer them. During his lifetime, the Old Testament laws were in effect like the New Testament laws are in effect for us today. Jesus viewed them as the word of God. We will see that is the same attitude that we should have towards the New Testament. Jesus obeyed the Old Testament, taught others to obey it, and rebuked those who did not understand or observe it. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes scripture each time Satan tempts him as the absolute standard of right and wrong. Even though the Old Testament was written many generations before his day, Jesus never disagreed with the Jews that it was a pattern revealing God's will. He used it as authority and expected others to do the same. Some criticize us today for using scripture as absolute authority. 
but that is precisely and exactly what Jesus and how he used it. Well, what was the attitude of the apostles and other inspired New Testament writers towards the Old Testament? The New Testament writers viewed the Old Testament scriptures as the inspired will of God revealing his very words to man. Peter in his second epistle that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's in chapter 1 verse 20 and 21. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 through 11 Paul writes that the Old Testament contains examples for our learning. James in his second chapter you are fulfilling the royal law according to scriptures, verse 8, and the scripture was fulfilled, verse 23. The New Testament writers realized Old Testament laws are not binding today. But this is because God himself removed the law and replaced it with the New Testament. But they are still recognizing the Old Testament was the very word of God. And as long as it was in effect, the Jews of all generations had to obey it. Even today, the Old Testament reveals principles that are useful and these examples as well. The New Testament writers used the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24 to 36, Peter said prophecies from David were fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts 17, verse 2 to 3, Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures to prove Jesus was the Christ. In making such arguments, these inspired men recognized the Old Testament as authority and proof for their position. And this is exactly what people say we do today and we shouldn't. That is to use the New Testament as proof for our position. Thirdly, the New Testament writers cited other New Testament events as fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. In Acts 2, verse 14 to 21, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Acts 15, verse 13 to 21, Old Testament prophecy provided evidence that the Gentiles could be saved according to the New Testament gospel. Both Jesus and his apostles recognized that behind the Old Testament scripture stood the authority and the infallibility of God himself. If the scripture said it, it must be true because that means God said it. The scriptures were the pattern for future generations. When you know what the scriptures say, then you know what God himself says. This serves as a pattern for us, meaning that we should have the same attitude towards the complete writings that they in the first century had towards the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament as it was being written. Well, what about the claims of the New Testament concerning itself? If we remember how these writers viewed the Old Testament writings, it will help us as we consider what the New Testament says about itself. Knowing what authority they claim the Old Testament possessed, they would have been very evil men if they falsely claim or only pretend to have that kind of authority. However, these New Testament writers claim their writings are an inspired revelation of God's will, just like the Old Testament was. Paul claims in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. Paul claims in Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy, verse 3 and 
uh, chapter 3, verse 16, 17, which was our scripture reading, Paul claims that all scripture is inspired by God. Not just the Old Testament, but all is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that everyone is equipped for every good work. Now, in short, the scripture is what we claim it to be, a revelation of God's will to teach us how to live our lives. But is the New Testament scripture? Now listen to Paul in 1 Timothy 5 verse 18. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is thrashing. He's quoting the Old Testament out of Deuteronomy 25 4. But then Paul goes on in 1 Timothy 5 18. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. He's quoting Jesus in Luke 10, verse 17, the New Testament. So the New Testament is cited by Paul as Scripture, just like the Old Testament. And both are cited as authority that proves what we ought to practice. In 2 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16, Peter refuted that all of Paul's letters as Scripture. The New Testament writings are a divine pattern. People having sin today must follow to be spiritually saved. The scriptures tell us how to obey the New Testament gospel for salvation. Belief, repentance, and water baptism. Now being saved, how the Christian assembles with the New Testament church to worship God. A cappella music, giving, Lord's Supper, preaching and teaching. How the New Testament church is organized, elders, deacons, evangelists, and saints. And how the New Testament Christian is to live in producing and providing good works of faith in order to remain in a saved state of God's grace. Also, the New Testament writings were intended to benefit future generations, even after the death of the New Testament writers. The apostles knew their letters or epistles would be circulated among the New Testament churches collectively and individual Christian disciples, and they desired it to be so. In Colossians 4, verse 16, Paul said that the letter he wrote to the church at Colossae should be read over here in the church of Lycia, and Lycia, what they have, have that church come over, and you read it here in Colossae. John's book a prophecy called Revelation was addressed to seven individual congregations in Asia Minor in the first century. In 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15, Peter wrote possibly to the same Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor as he wrote in his first letter, reminding them of the truths that they had been taught to call these things to their mind, as he says, the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Verse 14. In other words, death was coming to Peter. So the New Testament was not intended for the use of only a limited group of people. The New Testament writers knew that their letters would be used as authority by many people in many places for many years, even after their physical demise by the end of the first century, with the Apostle John being the last to depart and probably in the mid-90s. This is what they would expect, knowing that their writings would be classed as Scripture. They knew how the Old Testament Scriptures were circulated and respected, so they would have the same thought and feeling would be done with their New Testament scriptures. In John chapter 14, verse 26, talking to the apostles shortly before his death, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So they would be reminded 
of the things that Jesus had taught them during his ministry, but also would receive new teachings that Jesus had not told them before. So everything God desired revealed was given to the New Testament church during the lifetime of these apostles of the first century. Did Jesus tell the truth that all things revealed God's word would be taught to them over 1900 years or are we to look for future revelation? The New Testament clearly answers no about future revelations. Jude verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith, the New Testament doctrine has all been given to Christians. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Peter says everything we need for life and godliness has been given. Now since all has been provided, do you need additional information other than or outside the New Testament? No. Jude and Peter are in harmony with Jesus that all has been given. Now we have overwhelming, overwhelming evidence from the scriptures that the Bible only is from God. So we don't need extra man-made writings coming from the denominations. The scriptures in about 10 Old Testament and New Testament verses tell us clearly not to add to or take away from God's word. Now think about that for a moment. If any other writing has more than the Bible, that's too much by adding. If any other writing does not have enough, that's subtracting or too little. And if any other writing has the exact same thing, you don't need it because you already have the Bible. This morning, we have eliminated Catholic catechisms and traditions, Protestant creed books and manuals, Watchtower Society publications, the Book of Mormon, the Keys to the Scripture, the Koran, the Vedas, and a host of other thoroughly false writings being passed off as God's approved message. God will not speak to you in any of these writings, but only through his revealed Bible. And let me say that you can trust thoroughly the answer you find in your personal study. Starting this morning with God's New Testament plan of salvation, as we mentioned in the sermon, to believe to repent and be immersed in water for the washing away, the forgiveness of those sins. So if you're subject to that call and if you need to respond, then do it right now as together we stand. And as we stand. Sola Scriptura, or Scripture alone, is a term that states the Bible alone is a New Testament Christian's only infallible, and absolute authority for his faith and his practice. It is not only the biblical position, but also is the only logical position. If believers do not follow the Bible alone, then in fact, they are to some degree following frail men instead of God. God is the author and finisher of our salvation and not man. Therefore, New Testament Christians accept only what God has stated in his written word, the Bible. To understand why the Bible is the believer's single authority for our faith and practice, we must understand that God, or that Christ is God, the Savior, and the head of the New Testament church worldwide. Hebrews 1, verse 
1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. Now this passage says that God in the past, he spoke or he revealed himself to mankind in various manners. But in these last days, the Christian age, beginning in Acts chapter 2, spoke to us in his Son, which is Jesus Christ. In John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then down to verse 15, 14 and 15, still John 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has higher rank than I, for he existed before me. In Revelation 19, verse 11 and 16, John gives us a vision of Christ the conqueror. And this is what John said in verse 13. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So twice, John refers to the Son of God as the Word. Jesus was the full and complete expression of God's will to man. The beginning and the end of all revelation. Jesus, the Word, is the vehicle of conveying thoughts of God to his human creation. It is plain that God is telling us that he is revealing and directing us today by his Word, Jesus Christ. If you cannot separate, you cannot separate Jesus from the Word because he is the Word. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jesus is the Bible, as they are two separate objects. But the scriptures are his words. In a certain way, we are our word. Unfortunately, we mostly lie, and some of us tell a little truth, because that seems to be our nature. So our word might not mean much, but, um, but as we say that, Yet what we do say, it speaks a lot about us. Now my point here is, you preach or teach any thought not found in God's word as doctrine, it is a personal attack on Jesus Christ himself. To tamper with his spoken word is to twist his very thoughts. God cannot nor will he bless the ideas, the speculation, or opinions of man. Now in the New Testament, that was read literally by J, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, 17, again says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Not only does God say he inspired or God breathed the Bible, but also note the thoroughness of the scriptures. God states that his scriptures enables a man to be adequate and equipped for every good work. In other words, there is nothing that the scriptures don't address in the word or principle and that a man who follows them in his daily life, he will be adequate in all that he does. There is no need for the world and God's people to go anywhere else, but to God to learn of him and how to receive forgiveness of sins, eternal life, as well as spiritual guidance. This leaves no room of anything other than God's instructions for man or a local congregation to follow the Lord completely. God's Word, the Bible, is our sole source of knowledge about our God and Savior. In Psalms 19, verse 7 to 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. The precepts 
of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So here in this passage, God tells of that his word is perfect, without error, and that our sole foundation on which to base our faithfulness to him. If, however, anyone follows those who are denying the sole authority of the scriptures, that person or church is following men who are consciously or unconsciously following Satan. The devil is the deceiver and those who add to God's word and claim modern revelation, they force folks to face the following, the dictates of some follow, a fallible God, a group or an individual instead of going only to God directly. However, to read and follow the Bible is going directly to God and getting our instruction only from him. Jesus Christ is the head of the local ecclesia or called out assembly or congregation. The New Testament teaches that Christ is the head of every man. We are to grow up on all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, as Christ also is the head of the church. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Ephesians 4, verse 15, and chapter 5, verse 23. Nowhere in the New Testament do you find any statement that says that anyone else but Christ is the head of the church. The New Testament never mentions any man as being Christ vicar or priest or ec uh, ec uh, ecclesiastic, which is clergy or the entity as being the head over the body of Christ. Jesus is the chief shepherd of his flock, 1 Peter 5, 4. And having an eldership or a group of bishops is, according to Acts 20, verse 28, simply the overseers of the Lord's flock, 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Now, this group of men are not the absolute authority in the New Testament congregation, but are God's appointed men to see that the local congregation follows God's word, which is the absolute authority. And they do this by either preaching, teaching, or personal example. This group of men have no sanction from God to change, add to, or impart their personal views or force their opinions onto the Bible. These elders or pastors might be better called the under shepherds who tend to the Lord's flock of sheep with long suffering and doctrine as the master Jesus, who is the chief shepherd, has instructed them. God used the apostles and other inspired men and writers to give us the New Testament. As Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 21, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Since all these original men of the New Testament times are no more, when the Bible was completely written, there was no further need of such men. One crucial and critical principle that must be understood is that we are to test everything by the word of God. The scriptures stand alone as the only reliable test for God's truth. The Bible gives us the means to examine what we are told by men and by different types of churches. Without the written word, we haven't, we haven't any conclusive way to test the institution, the traditions, 
the supposed revelation or the teaching of any church or any mere man. If we don't accept the Bible as our only authority, then we have no effective way to examine the authenticity of what we are told. Now, most churches do not follow the clear teachings of the Bible, yet they claim that they are valid churches representing God's truth. For example, the Roman Catholic Church and half of the Protestant churches baptized by sprinkling. However, the New Testament word for baptism and the instructions concerning proper baptism absolutely exclude any other mode than immersion. So the question is, where did these churches get their authority to baptize by sprinkling? The answer is from their church fathers or their church traditions centuries after the New Testament were completed. They are a clear violation of God's word. What happened was that some council of men with unlawful authority in their church ignored God's word and instead they instituted the practice based on human reasoning without any biblical basis for doing so. Using human, fallible logic, they determined that they know or knew more than God. They ignored sound hermical principles of interpretation, establishing immersion alone as the proper mode of baptism. Thus, the church or individual who follows such teachings are not following the Lord, but are being misled by the teaching of mere men. Therefore, these churches who claim to be representing God are in fact teaching false doctrine and practices that are contrary to God's instructions and they will be punished. It is the Bible that tells us that they are wrong and are misleading their people from the truth to error. So the scripture is the only biblical and logical position for a true child of God to seek and to practice. If we follow the Bible, we can be assured that we are pleasing to God as well as obeying him. Again, it was Christ who instituted the local church and doctrine. A church does not establish doctrine or truth. A church is to preach and teach and tell humanity how to live according to God's word. It is Christ through his written word that instructs, establish, and dictates what is his word. God inspired and selected writers of the Bible to record his word into written form. The fact is that if anyone disallows the sole authority of the scriptures, he is left with a very, very serious dilemma. What does he then accept as God's infallible word? Where does he go for God's truth? Does he then appeal to some church or religious leader as being the authority? The denominations have traditions, practices, and doctrines that clearly contradict the Bible and even each other. It is an erroneous statement to say that God has not told us that his written word is the only authority for our faith and practice. Again, all scripture is inspired of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16. Nowhere in God's written word are we told to go anywhere else to learn his revelation. Only in the Bible can we trust for our eternal salvation. And not somewhere else that teaches baptism is sprinkling or also declares that water immersion is not necessary for salvation. Because water immersion is essential to one's salvation, as that is the time and the place where sins are forgiven 
if one prior to being baptized believes and repents as recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. So if you're subject to this call and if you need to respond through belief, repentance, and water immersion for the forgiveness of your sins, then now's the time to do it as together we stand and as we sing.